Hello, everybody, and this is The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. Today, I'm very excited because we have a very, very special guest today. His name is Andy Semachuk, and he is an amazing um, lawyer. He's an immigration lawyer, but not only is he an immigration lawyer, he is also a very talented author, and he has written five books, and we're going to talk about his books, but we're going to start off with his book, uh, Solomia. It's the star of the opera, The Golden Age, and he has won awards for his books, and he's just an amazing individual with a captivating story behind it. So I'm so uh, proud to have you on our show. I'm very excited to speak with you, Andy. Can you tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do? Sure. I I'm a U.S. and Canadian immigration attorney. I work with Pace Law Firm in Toronto. Previously, I've worked in the United States 10 years in Los Angeles, five years in New York practicing law, and I'm a former UN correspondent. I write for Forbes on immigration, and I, as you mentioned, I've published five books. I'm an author, and I'm also a professional speaker. So when we first met and talked, I realized, boy, we've got a lot in common. I think our lives have uh, had parallel tracks. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's amazing. You know, I, um, when I spoke to you even before our podcast, you, you know, I, I really feel that we do have a lot in common. It's, it's, uh, and, and the books that you've written are outstanding. And, uh, can you tell me a little about what possessed you or your passion behind becoming, you know, cause you're, you've been an immigration lawyer for so many years. And then all of a sudden you had this drive and this passion to write books and you wrote Solomia, you know, um, so what what drove you? What was your passion to start writing? Well, if my English professor from university, English 101, learned that today I'm an author and writer and, you know, I'm writing for Forbes and written books that have won awards, he'd turn over in his grave because I barely <laughs> made it through first year English at university. He took pity on me and finally passed me at the end of the year because he, <laughs> I, I, he knew I couldn't go anywhere without passing his course. But somehow over time, you know, I took a great interest in communication. And I know this is a field you love as well. Mm -hmm. And communication to see uh, a reason why I took such interest in communication is my wife, my, my mother was deaf. She raised me as a, a single parent, deaf. My father died when I was nine years old. So she oh. was uh, left with taking care of me. And so, unlike others, uh, to me, communication, especially with my mother, but with her challenges uh, dealing with the world, became very important. And uh, although I did want to work in the legal field, I continually tried to improve my communication skills, both writing and speaking. And over time, uh, I started writing books, and now I have like five books that have come out. And I think if you're if you're thinking of writing a book, uh, the challenge is getting the first book out. It's, you know, for everybody, it's a challenge. But if you get one book out, chances are very good you're going to be writing several books. Mm -hmm. And you can, I'll tell you if you're an author or not, if you show me your garage, when you open the garage, if there's books in there, you're an author. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're traveling around with books all over the place. And of course, you want people to read your books. Uh, in my case, I realized that um, one of the most powerful things you can do is tell stories, uh, such as the story I want to tell about Solomia, uh, because they change people's lives. They give them a, a sense of uh, meaning, or, or they lift them motivationally. They give them purpose. They find... Uh, through such stories, meaningful stories. And let me just share one from Solomia that I think is very good. Uh, this is the 120th anniversary this year of the opera Madame Butterfly. Uh, and uh, the story behind Madame Butterfly, which is in my book, is pretty profound. And basically it's this, that uh, initially, it's a story about a, a geisha girl in Japan at the time when Japan was isolated from the world and opened up by the American Navy in the 1880s. And in this story, 
which was first written up by an American journalist who learned about it on traveling to Japan and, and wrote this story and then made into a play which was shown in London. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the composer uh, uh, Puccini, Giacomo Puccini, saw the play and he was moved by the play and he decided, I have to have this, to put it on as an opera and put it on in La Scala in Italy, which is the leading opera theater in the world. And the story is basically that this uh, geisha girl meets this naval officer named uh, 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 now, my, the name is uh, slipping uh, my mind, but uh, at any way, he, she meets this naval officer, Pinkerton. Sorry about that. That's okay. And uh, they have a relationship, and they and they they go through a form of marriage in Japan, and they uh, sleep together. And and uh, following a, a short time of being together, Pinkerton announces that he has been called back to the United States and has to leave. Uh, but he promises that he'll come back to Chio Chio San, this uh, this uh, geisha girl, mm -hmm. and and uh, unknown to him, uh, Chio Chio San is pregnant and is going to have his son. So he leaves, and she waits for his return. Waits four years or four or five years for his return, and finally he does come back. And in the meantime, she has his son, and he's now four or five years old. And when Pinkerton arrives back in Japan, he's he has an American wife following with him. And the the parents of the child are then faced, Chio Chio San and Pinkerton, with this question: what do we do with this child? Uh, do we leave him to live in with a geisha girl in Japan, or should he come back to the United States? And they resolve it's best for him to go back to the United States. And just before he leaves, the child leaves, Chio Chio San takes the child off to the side and she shares these words with the child, uh, her final words with the child. And she says this, she says, look at this face. It is the face of your mother. Remember it. You will never see it again. And mm -hmm. after that, she gives the child to Pinkerton who takes it. Uh, back to the United States. She ultimately uh, commits Harry Carey and dies. That's uh, the story behind the opera. And yeah. uh, Puccini put it on at La Scala, but it collapsed. People hated it. They whistled him down. And after it collapsed, uh, he was crestfallen. He didn't know what to do. Uh, so he went to his good friend, Arturo Toscanini, who was a leading uh, conductor at that time, opera conductor, saying, Arturo, what do I do? And Arturo said to him, uh, there's only one person who can help you resurrect this opera. An opera star who was then already an opera star, namely Salumia, Salumia Krushernitska, the uh, character who I wrote the book about, who was my great aunt, my, my grandmother's sister. At any rate, uh, Toscanini said, go see her, talk to her, see if you can resurrect it. And he did. And Salumia agreed to perform the lead role. Uh, she was about 30 at the time, but the lead role was about a geisha girl 15. So it was quite a challenge. And in order to get into the role, she wore a Japanese kimono or uh, some dress uh, every day for something like two or three months before they performed. And yeah. they revised the opera and they performed it to great success in Brescia, a city about 60 miles away from Milan and La Scala. And from there, it went on to world fame. It's one of the great operas today, even today, 120 years later. Yeah. After 100 performances, Solomia said to him, look, this is the last time that I'm performing. And she gave Puccini back his script at that stage. That story is in the book, in the Solomia book. Uh, and uh, I'll just share this one other thing about the book. Look, I'm a grandfather. I'm also a father and a grandfather. I have a daughter and I have a granddaughter. And one of the things I need for them is role models, successful models of women who have achieved great greatness in their lives. And this is one such role model. 
it's she's not a, she's not well known today. That's why I published this book in English, so uh -huh. that people may learn about her, and uh, that's why I wanted to share that story with you today. I think that's amazing. You know, we do need more uh, women role models that, especially that have been, you know, from the the days of, of, of history, you know, we, when we look back and, you know, the, these women, they were, they were so strong. They were so powerful. They, you know, they were so, they were, they were confident and they felt self-worth, you know, and they believed in whatever the cause was and they, and they moved forward and, and they, they did whatever they could. And, and it was a man's world, but yet they still, they still, you know, fought the odds and they challenged themselves and they and they won because they they proved themselves to be worthy women. They made a, a name for themselves. And and at the same time, they became mentors to to millions of people and to have that legacy, to be able to have that book, to be able to share that book with others and others can see that even back then they were courageous women out there who, you know, believed in a cause and were going to do anything to make that make that cause happen. And, you know, and that's what we 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 need that for today's society, too, because I think with the media and, and the way society turns, I think sometimes what is a good role model and what is not a good role model. And it's important to take those those women who really made us stand in our in our in our history and really put an imprint in our history and and show people what true role models are. So I, I, I think it's wonderful that you wrote that book. And I, I'm amazed that and it's wonderful that it was it was someone from your family. And you're you know, you're keeping that memory alive by writing that book. She, she was uh, a big star the world's leading soprano in the 1900s, the first decade of the 1900s. And we oh, spoke wow. earlier about uh, uh, Ariana Huffington and her story about Maria Callas, who later, more recently, was world's yeah. biggest uh, opera star. A similar story, you know. Um, right. And uh, one of the intriguing aspects to me about this story was uh, what, what happened why are her male contemporaries, people like Caruso, Puccini, Toscanini, remembered? But why is she not remembered? There's a feminist issue here, you know. And uh, the book goes into that. Uh, part of the reason is she ended up behind the Iron Curtain in oh. World War II, and uh, she was isolated. There's more to that than just that. But, um, yeah, it's true. The, you know, the role model is this lady was a mentor to Caruso. Now, you know, for you and I, who maybe don't sp spend every day in opera, doesn't mean very much. But for opera people, uh, they may know, or some of us even who don't pay attention to opera. And by the way, opera is just, this is where she made her career. This is not a book about opera. This is a right. book about a woman and achievement. And, yes. what, and what you can do as a woman and someone is seeking to achieve. Um but she uh, she uh, she mentored Caruso, and for those who may know, uh, Pavarotti. Pavarotti was uh, today's Caruso back then. Yeah. Uh, uh, so he uh, he was of the same class, and she mentored uh, Car Caruso. So that's an example of what you're talking about about women making a difference in the world. And she was, by the way, in the United States in 1928. The same year that the Chrysler Building was built in New York, she came to New York. She performed in New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, in Montreal, in uh, Winnipeg. And uh, like in 1928, during the Roaring Twenties, she was in New York when Harlem was like the seat of, you know, jazz, like in the world, Duke Ellington, all these guys, she was there because she loved music and, you know, all kinds of music. Including yeah. that. So that's a bit from the book. Uh, and I thank you for the opportunity to share at least that part of, uh, you know, of my life in terms of writing. I think it's so important that people have mentors like that and they read about people like that because, you know, being able to, to realize that you can achieve to a higher level. And nowadays you do see a lot of women 
grouping together and and you know working together to show that they you know in in especially in the in the uh, entrepreneur world or the corporate world or the business world you know trying to make a stand for themselves trying to show that they are able to to achieve that anything that you know that a male could achieve and because for for the longest time it wasn't like that, you know, and now things are starting to change. But when you have, you, you look back in history, it's always been there. It's just that we really need to open our eyes and, and look at history. And there, there are many women figures from history that have made huge achievements and have made their mark in the world. It's just a lot of people just don't know about them. Right. Uh, but, you know, uh, I've written a few other books uh, you mentioned, um, and I'm not going to go into them. Uh, I, they're all on Amazon. If anybody wants to, you know, if they look up my name, Andy Semichuk, they could get uh, my books on Amazon. This particular one, if you look for Solomia, uh, Star of Opera's uh, Golden Age, you'll find it. It's a book with a gold cover, uh, so you'll easily find, uh, find it. But I should also mention, uh, you know, um, I'm also a lawyer and, uh, you know, I work in the area of immigration. Um, like it's, I, I write for Forbes on that subject. So uh, when you talked about how did I get into writing and, and things like that, uh, part of it was writing these articles uh, on immigration themes that helped me build up my, uh, my, you know, knowledge of writing. And, and I mentioned about the, the, intense interest I have in communication. I know you are a, a speaker, uh, uh, you know, like a, you know, like a well-known speaker. And that's an area I've been interested in a long time as well. I spent many years studying, uh, speaking, going to, you know, uh, meetings once a week, watching people speak and, and then watching, giving feedback to, to speakers. I, I'm sure you've been in that, that scenario as well. Uh, I like the the uh, in terms of your life and what you've accomplished. Um, you know, you you've talked about epilepsy, for example. Uh, you shared a, a few thoughts with me before, and we talked about how. What I liked about what you said was, uh, you you have to. It's important to keep a, a perspective, uh, and in a conversation I shared with you, if you look at your life as a huge circle. Mm -hmm. uh, drawn on a piece of paper, uh, problems that you may have in your life, you could uh, depict by drawing either a smaller circle or a dot in the middle of this larger circle. And the key to our lives, which you pointed out in our conversation earlier before we went online, was the perspective of not focusing just on the problems of your life, but the larger picture of your life and keeping uh, your life in perspective that way. I, I thought that was a very valuable conversation that we had. It's a good insight. Um, I think I think a, a lot of people, you know, they, they worry too much and they focus on a lot of little issues in life that really, um, you know, we shouldn't have to worry about the um, the little things in life, you know, they could easily be solved and we shouldn't worry about the problems that haven't occurred. You know, you can't change the future. We don't know what's there. So why worry about it until, you know, a problem occurs and then you, you focus on that head on, you know, and you do whatever you can to solve that problem. But, you know, to, to worry about the, you know, about the little things in life it, it, and to make it more than what it is or to just aggravate yourself over small things, it's just not worth it. Time is too valuable, you know, and 70% and of stress causes illness. So why put yourself in that negative, you know, um, era, you know, that area? And then, you know, to, to worry about problems that don't exist that could, you know, could be and it might be, and we don't know what's going to be. So just focus on now, focus on what you have in front of you. And I think that's a, a valuable lesson for everybody. And, um, you know, I, I, I thank you for bringing that up. And, you know, that's a, it's an important point that I think people should focus on. But I do like that you, you had mentioned about another book that you had written about today's society, about, about jobs and about focusing on balance. 
And I think that's a, a great um, book to bring up when, you know, maybe you could show that book because in today's society, I think so many people, um, you know, the young professional, yes. Um, you know, it's a guide to, to help people. And you know, maybe you can share with people what, what it's about because I think it's really important. Oh, thank you for, for letting me uh, do that. So um, in my role as an immigration lawyer at Pace Law Firm here in Toronto, uh, over the years, I've helped thousands of young people going into the work world, getting work visas. And I noticed three common problems that these young people have, and probably most of us have. Uh, one or more of these three problems. One is uh, money. The second is time. And the third is balance. And uh, so the question is, how do you deal with these three problems? And uh, briefly, I'll just say the three ways that I deal with each one of the three. In the case of money, I think that's related to the question of your unique ability and finding your unique ability and putting it to the service of others. That would mm -hmm. be the key, and I would develop that, and it's developed in the book. In the case of time, uh, I like to uh, work with the 80-20 rule, uh, you know, uh, Pareto's principle, uh, for those that know about the, you know, Italian economists that came up with this, that 20% um, of um, the people make 80% of the money, 20% of the effort gives you 80% of the return that you're looking for. So I'd right. like to explore that in more detail. And in case of balance, which is probably an area that you're more of an expert on than I am, if not on all these areas. Um, I talk about um, your values, uh, if you depict them in terms of, a, let's say, a pie chart, and the yeah. values may be things like uh, family, uh, or they may be uh, things like uh, uh, God, or they might be things like... Uh, money or whatever it is if you isolate the key values of your life and nobody can do this for you you have to do it your your life your values are your values nobody else's mm -hmm. um, uh, you'll end up with a pie chart and you can measure each value let's say from one to ten if you imagine like spokes coming out of a, a bicycle uh tire yeah uh, any value can be measured one to 10 on a spoke. For example, let's say money. How important is money in your life? Is it right. one or is it 10? 10 being the most important. Is, yes. uh, you know, uh, family important one or is it 10 and so on. And if you connect all these spokes together, you make a, a circle. And if you look at your circle and it's a flat tire, then you know you're not in balance. But yeah. if, if your circle looks like a, a tire, like uh, then you know you are in balance. And right. then is how do you keep yourself in balance? So that's uh, that's all discussed in my book, The Young Professional, which again is involved, uh, is available uh, on Amazon. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, these are uh, these are sort of uh, this one is a career guide book. The other one we talked about was kind of a history. Uh, personal development book. Um, I also, uh, you know, I'm concerned, like I'm Ukrainian in background. We were talking that I learned that you're uh, a Greek, a Greek in background. Everybody's got some background. You came from somewhere. I came uh -huh. from Ukrainian background. I was born in Canada, but my, my parents came from Ukraine. Right. right now, Ukraine is a big deal in terms of the war. Yeah, and, uh, we talked a little bit about that before. Uh, I, I mentioned, you know, someone breaks into your house and says, uh, "You know what? I'm living here now." And you say, "Wait a minute, this is my house. What are you? What are you doing in my house?" This yeah, is the yeah. problem Ukraine has right at the moment, uh, on a global scale. And right. the, the people right now in Washington are meeting. The uh, you know NATO countries are meeting, trying to figure out how to deal with this, and. Uh, like World War II, which is also discussed, by the way, in my book, uh, my books here. Um, 50 million people died at the end of World War II, you know, by the end of World War II. Why? One of the key reasons was because boundaries of countries were not settled. So yeah. after the war, people 
got together at the UN at Helsinki and they said, okay, no more boundary disputes. Mm -hmm. this, these are the boundaries, well signing, these are the boundaries. You want to change, you have to get agreement. You can't just mark, well, all of a sudden, you know, 75 years later, Russia decided they're going to change the boundary. Yeah. And so we have this, now we have NATO, you know, meetings talking about what's going on, why is this going on? Yeah. Anyway, that's a little bit about what we could talk about, but that's like at the you know the the, the big level high high level uh, worries in the world, um, and you know maybe we can't do very much other than be informed. Yeah, know, and and help to the degree we can. Like two nights ago, uh, Russian bombs uh, bombed a uh, children's hospital in Kiev, uh, where uh, it's a cancer ward. It was obliterated you know little kids out on the streets with masks on trying to elect ridiculous ridiculous anyway yes. you know so uh that's something our leaders have to face you know what's coming in that in that context and um i appreciate the opportunity of at least sharing a few thoughts about that with you it's it's an important subject. There's so many different, you know, wars going on. And you see, and like we had mentioned earlier before we went on air, you know, wars have been going on for centuries and nobody wins. There is no side that is a win winner. And the only thing is we lose lives and we lose, you know, we lose precious lives and we destroy beautiful you know, um, pieces of land that had such beautiful history to it. So not only are people dying, you're you're destroying history, you're destroying a, a, a beautiful, you know, place that, you know, um, that they're going to have to try to build for, you know, from scratch once everything, you know, gets sustained if it does. And it's going to take it's going to take, you know, decades and decades to to get to that point. Um, but, you know, it, it's just no, no matter, you know, people, if you look back in history, nobody ever won. And yet we still have these people that are still provoking fights and wars and, 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 and they're, you know, and, and no side is a winner and people are getting hurt. People are getting killed. Um, even, even our American soldiers who go in and try to help, they're coming back with post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, we're losing lives also. And so it, it, it's, it's a, it's a no way win situation. So why does it keep having to happen? You know, people have that, you know, people say we're fighting for a cause that there is no cause, you know, it, it, it's greed, it's ego. It's, it's about power. It's about, you know, having a big ego, you know, it's about, you know, those are the things that, that make, you know, war go on, you know, um, and, and, and it's just, it's, uh, and it's very sad because you see so many people, you know, it, it are getting hurt. Um, you're, nobody's winning, you know, people are, people are getting so involved that they're, you know, that even, even hatred and anger towards other nationalities are, are being, you know, um, you know, are being, are starting to come out, you know, when in, they're innocent people, they have nothing to do with it, just their culture, you know, um, where they, where their roots come from. But yet people are, 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 are showing anger and exerting anger in, in unconstructive ways towards these individuals. But, you know, it, is it doing any good? Is it really helping, you know? Um, I don't think so, you know, um, but, you know, how do we make this, how do we change? How do we wake up people? You know, is the question, you know, will we ever wake up people in this society? Well, uh, uh, you lead your life as best you can. You do mm -hmm. what you can, make contributions wherever you can, and yes. be open under, to understand what's going on, and to be on you know, on guard for your life and your values, you know, yes. like freedom, uh, democracy, human rights. These are all, you know, fundamental values that you have to look after. And, uh, yeah, sure that, uh, you know, they're, they're if you don't attend your garden, your garden is going to have weeds is, is the way to look yes. at it. So, right. But I really am grateful to you for, uh, you know, enabling me to 
comment on these things and uh, share these thoughts with you. Um, I I, uh, I appreciate your work and what you've been doing. I can see, you know, I've learned a lot about you th from this visit. Uh -huh. uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I admire you because you, you're up in the ozone layer up there with uh -huh. all the big, big names uh, that, that you've shared, you know, that you know and uh, that you work with. So, um, and uh, you're doing well. Look, this podcast means a lot. I think, mm. you know, especially, you know, your contributions, uh, like through your books and this podcast and the people you've touched with your, you know, your presentations and uh, the videos and so on. It's a, a legacy. It's a good legacy. Well, thank you. And I think you're doing the same thing. You know, you really, by the books that you've written and and, and really bringing your own family's history to, to life, you know, um, you're you're doing the same thing. And, you know, and, and it's so important because not only are you just keeping uh, a, a beautiful woman who had such a beautiful history and made such an impact in 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 her era and is a mentor to others you're you're bringing her back to, you know to the surface where other people can learn about her and and learn from her for, from her actions you know and uh so you're you're doing the same thing you're you know you're doing the same thing and you're making the same contributions which is wonderful and you know and, and it's wonderful that you looked at your daughter and you looked at your granddaughter and you and you want them to realize you know you know that achieve you know being you know an achiever is, is important leaving a legacy is important having a purpose in life is important and these are things that you know people should realize you know that we all here for a, a valid purpose you know and figuring out what that purpose is and, and figuring out what your passion is and then going after it and you know doing something good with that so when you do leave at least you can leave knowing that you made a valid contribution to this world you know and i think that's what it's all about i really do and uh, i really thank you now if you had to take everything that you've spoken about today and you really wanted to emphasize on some, some important factors what are some of the things you'd like to get across to the listeners today that you really think are important that they understand okay well uh let me say this uh, it's hard to summarize everything i have like in in thoughts yes yes One way is simply to uh take a look at the the books i've mentioned uh, they're available on Amazon. Uh, if you need a list of the books, you can uh, get them at uh, my, I have a personal website. It's called myworkvisa.com. And there my books are all listed if you, you know, if you're particularly interested in what books I've uh, published. Um, I think I'll, I'll share a key uh, thought in my life, which I hope people will resonate with, you know, that they'll, it'll resonate with them. And that is a, a thought that I took from uh, the great speaker Zig Ziglar, who you may know. Yes. And his his uh, comment was, "You can get anything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want." Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a brilliant idea. That's a great. There are two philosophies in life. Yes. You can get anything you want so long as you help enough other people get what they want. Is yes. One. And the other one is, give me what I want and to hell with everybody else. Yeah. <laughs> the more we do Zig's version versus the other one, the better the world will be, in my opinion. Yeah. Oh, 100%. Uh, just final thoughts. Uh, I hope that the people who are listening uh, will consider what's happening in Ukraine and, and be sympathetic uh, to that country. Uh, it's unfortunate, and uh, they're doing their best to fight, and they're not fighting just for themselves, but for democracy overall. And, mm -hmm. and you know, NATO is talking about that right now in Washington. Um, that's about it. Uh, you know, I I, I hope that uh, what I've shared uh, has some benefit to the people who are listening. And uh, thank you for letting me be on your show. Oh, you're very welcome. And do you do any type of services or consultations for people who may be interested in writing a book or may be interested in, in learning any of the things that you talk about? Do you do any consultations or services to provide to help to others? Yes. 
You can reach me by looking at the Pace Law Firm website, pacelawfirm.com. And uh, you can reach me there, my emails there and so on. And uh, I can help anybody who might be interested in that kind of thing or anything on immigration for that matter. Wonderful. Uh, this has been a very pleasurable experience. I, I think what you're doing is wonderful. I think all the books that you've written are, are fabulous. I, I, you know, and, you know, one of the things that you said and you had mentioned about your, the, you know, your, your grandson has, you know, has a sense of humor and you took his jokes and you, you, you know, you, you wrote a book about them to bring, you know, laughter to others and to really keep his little legacy alive too. all those jokes from when he was growing up, because now he's a grown man. But, you know, laughter is the best uh, medicine, I believe, you know, before we go, you know, we can be serious and we can stress ourselves out and we can, you know, but we can only do what we can do, like you mentioned, uh, you know, but, but if we could look at the, the better side of life and we can, you know, look at humor, I think humor and, and laughter are, are things, if we can incorporate them into our lives, can relieve a lot of stress and bring a lot of joy to our lives. So, you know, um, I, I really respect that you, you did that and, and you took your grandson's jokes and made them into a book and, and they're very cute. And, uh, and I really think that, you know, humor is something everybody should, you know, try to loosen up and, and be a little humorous at times because, uh, you know, it's it's not worth, you know, being serious and taking everything, you know, to core and and being able to to look at life on the brighter side and to laugh off things and to and to make the best of everything is is the best way to go about it. Can I share one last a little story? Of course. Yeah. Okay. Uh this is a humor. It's about parrots. I love parrots, so I'm gonna share the story. <laughs> so uh, it's a story you haven't heard. Uh, a lady buys a parrot and comes home, and as she's trying to teach this parrot mm -hmm. how to speak, and uh, people come in and out of her house, so she decided the thing she's going to teach the parrot is to be able to answer the door when someone knocks on the door. So she's trying to teach the parrot, uh, who is it? So mm -hmm. she says to the parrot, who is it? Who is it? Who is it? And she goes to the store to buy some groceries, leaving the parrot alone in the house. And the plumber comes by, he comes, knocks on the door, and the parrot says, who is it? And the plumber says, it's the plumber. And the parrot says, who is it? And the guy says, it's the plumber. And the parrot says, who is it? And the guy gets so exasperated by this that he faints. And uh, <laughs> he's lying there on the doorstep, and the wife, uh, the, the mother comes home, the, the, the lady comes home, and she sees this guy lying on the doorstep. And she says, oh, my goodness, what's happened here? I wonder who is it? And the parrot says, it's the plumber. <laughs> the story is, I guess, basic, basically tells us, you know, repetition is the way to learn. So you got to read books and, you know, do things like speak and attend on programs like yours to get better and uh, lead our lives in that way. Thanks. Thanks a million for having me on your show. Oh, thank you. Thank you for being on the show. This was so enjoyable and you provided a wealth of information and I can't re wait to read your book. I'm going to read uh, Sola Mia and uh, I, I really look forward to, to, to getting a copy of it. But thank you so much. You provided a, a wealth of knowledge and I think, you know, I really appreciate all the things that you came on the show and shared with us. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing. Okay, great to, to be on your show. Oh, thank you. And it's great to have you. And you have a great day. Take care. Bye-bye.